recording here with John Takax from the OSE dev team. John, so I had a very interesting discussion today, actually. It's, it could be a real breakthrough indeed. So I talked to my coach, my marketing coach. I'm actually not going to say names yeah. here because um, the stuff that we're doing is very powerful, I think. And we don't want to get in trouble. Yeah. So the idea is, um, I mentioned the Hero X challenge, right? And we really delved yeah. into the idea of, okay, what does it take for the first ever open source distributive enterprise product to be noticed? Okay? Because that's actually yeah. has happened. History has already passed us with a 3D printer. And... 3D printer is essentially an industry transformed by open source, but you can't really hear about it. You don't really hear about it anywhere for various reasons. Uh, so right. from the standpoint of, but also from the standpoint of distributed enterprise, I think the 3D printing has not really achieved a lot in terms of viable, economically significant production outside of yeah. uh, people largely tinkering or doing that as a hobby. So we... Um, talked about okay let's talk about the cordless drill how do we make that happen where it's a real crowd incentive challenge and then we go forward with that where the interest the, the incentive it's not only the prize but also the fact that we're recruiting for people who are actually going to start the businesses so this is for me it was a breakthrough discussion because for one my coach completely understood this idea of the potential i mean the potential in summary is the capacity to transform entire billion dollar industries and i would say probably on a time scale of three years so if you take a look yeah. at the cordless drill that's a 10 billion dollar industry and what if instead of right. four major brands in the world we had thousands or potentially millions of people producing that in their communities and also getting the marketing and all of that so very very yeah. compelling discussion uh my coach and i are definitely pursuing that as a topic and it's completely relevant to uh once again the idea of distributive enterprise where right. can we start showing some real economics and that's that's the same theme that we have right here with respect to our discussion where how do we get an open source viable business happening with 3d printed products in general so anyway, I'm pretty excited about all this. I think this this could be a major breakthrough because it's the first time that someone from the outside, completely from the outside, so this is a professional coach working in the world of mainstream yeah. business that has really grokked onto yeah. this and really, really sees the potential. And, and the discussion actually started with, okay, if software has succeeded, why hasn't hardware? So we looked into that a little bit and we're trying to go forward on that. Yeah. So, yeah. But Absolutely, go ahead. Absolutely, yeah. I mean, so, yeah, so, I mean, we look at uh, 3D printing today, and, you know, uh, some of the examples I brought up were um, Voodoo, how they have a, um, a full chain where they're able to utilize a cluster of uh, 32 printers, have a robot auto-eject part, have people order a yeah. print online. Um, and then when I look at, uh, you know, professional experience, but a uh, systems controls engineer, and, uh, you know, working at Wright Patterson Air Force Base, with other um, institutions like that, seeing how there's print clusters of, you know, 30 or so print clusters of robots tending to it that they're printing out uh, machine goods at high accuracy, high precision, but those are $500,000 to $1 million dollar piece of machines. And um, those are printing in metal? And, 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 yeah, uh, direct laser uh, metal sintering process, yeah. uh, where a, uh, la you, know, you may yeah. have heard of one, laser shoots sure. out of powder, do stuff together. Um, so, yeah, I mean, so just, just, there's, that is happening out there, but just, um, you know, being out in the, in the world, Brovisys is the, the second uh, leading uh, controls company in America, second largest, and we just do everything from beer to um, making cheese it to... Uh, oil and gas, the oil pipeline, mm -hmm. steam boilers, any, all these different control systems. Perhaps. And the one thing all these plants have is... Oh, say the website again? Battery your your company? System. Rovisys. R-O-V-I-S-Y-S. Rovisys.com. Yeah. It, 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 it's very... It's all word of mouth, and it's not really a well-known company at all, but it's the... It, 
pretty much does all the control systems for all the major companies out there. And, uh-huh. uh, you know, lots of people I'm talking to are super, um, you know, supportive of me, you know, working on this stuff. In the now, so, do they actually um, see any conflicts of interest right. or anything like that? No, no, not at all. Um, you know, because I'm not using anything. Uh, it's just common. This is all common knowledge stuff that I'm right. using here. Uh, we regularly produce custom MES solutions. It's just, it's like you have a... Um, you know, program for that, and the stuff I'm I'm working on for it is not anything that's like any proprietary software just comes from the computer. I know the concepts of it, I'm able to apply them, I'm not using anyone else's methods for applying those concepts besides my own. Yeah, some of yeah. those in a bit. Um, but generally, a manufacturing execution system, uh, broadly, and uh, I've covered lots of those points in the wiki, but to kind of summarize for the purpose of this, it's a um, taking all the inputs to the factory, tracking all those inputs as they go into an output, and planning production as or as they're placed. So someone places yeah. this for different components, how do you realize it? So um, what ends up happening is all the different parts are also products, and a product is a part. And so each of those parts requires certain pieces to make it to a certain point to become the next part in a MES for a adaptive factory. They, they, those do exist out there. They're very rare. Normally, it's continuous. You, just have, you know, resources and resources out. But here, um, what I'm proposing for the open source factory, for the um, uh, made-to-order customizable factory facility, is a MES where um, the parts are... Um, yeah, so basically, you take a drill, for instance, right? Uh, a drill comes out and has, the part is a drill, and this part has these parts within it. One is the shell, one is a circuit board, one is a motor. And each of those parts has assembly instruction. And assembly instruction always is associated with a machine that performs assembly instruction. And each assembly instruction has well, what parts go into it to make the end result. And that could be a 3D printer filament, and the machine could be a 3D printer. It could be a robot arm and screws. So yeah. on that powerful concept, that's just something. And that's how it's done in industry. Yeah. Um, broadly. And so at each one of those stages, you have, hey, this is how many orders we have. How do we uh, optimize it through the machines and build the product? And so what I want to do as part of the distributed enterprise is just release this to the public so this can help a person who has one 3D printer manage their workflow. Absolutely. A person with a 3D What's printer SDS is the cloud mill, mill to be able to manage their own business. What does SDS stand for? Or robot family. Uh, software design specification. Okay. Um, is it, and that's basically as it. It's a statement of what are the features we need and as features of software and what as a user, does the user want out of the software? And how do you break it down into little modules, easily attackable modules that a team can work on to get to the final result? Are you a coder, too? You're not a coder, are you? I am. I'm a, I'm a computer engineer. Also, you... Special computer engineer. I do all three. Yeah. Oh, wow. Um, would you be yep. coding some of this stuff up yourself, or is it more about find, yeah. helping us find a team? Can, but definitely can use a team. Um, yeah, I, I can do the uh, lots of the automation side of this because there's just this system is so broad. Um, yeah. It starts really simple on just receiving orders online, having this you know database of parts and assembly instructions, and a database of G code files, and having a list of parts and having those G code files sent out to 3D printers to print parts, and right. have someone come home with the parts eject and say, okay, now I can ship this out, or okay. that. And then, you... then it goes to everything printed, being inspected, oh, that whole deal. Are Lots you of thinking people. of using a platform such as Open ERP or Odoo, O-D-O-O Community Edition? Um, yeah, yeah, so I mean, as far as uh, tracking it, what I would like to use is the uh, source background. I'd like to use Python uh, exclusively. Uh, for the entire thing and manage the packages for the software, something called Anaconda. That's used for scientific uh, Python computing, completely open source, 
mm-hmm. and allows easily distributed, you know, packages or executable to build uh-huh. an environment that can be easily distributed to Raspberry Pis, which uh-huh. I'm kind of intending. I'm kind of intending those being the main uh, process controllers or PLCs, as we call them in the industry, uh, for uh, this kind of solution to drive automation. Um, can you? Yeah, you know, those would be like. Can you run? Yeah, but. Can you run Anaconda also on Arduinos, or is it too small? Arduino oh, too small. No, uh, it's it's uh, totally uh, Anaconda is just that's just a uh, development environment and package management, and so that put aside. That's just um, if you're familiar you with Linux, probably you have an app to get. App to get, you can kind of relate that to Anaconda, and okay. very loosely you relate those. So Anaconda is Python. It's just it, it is Python. Yeah, hundred percent. Um, it's just okay. a way of uh, distributing it a managed project. Uh, okay. So basically Python. So uh, Python on an Arduino. Um, and so, you know, it's an Atmel. For me, an Arduino is just an Atmel uh, MCU that has an Arduino ROM on it for Arduino. So, yeah, I mean, I'm sure there's ROMs that can run an Atmel processor on an, on an Arduino board. But that aside, you know, Working with the Arduino ROM, uh, I don't think the Arduino ROM can't run Python. It can just run um, its own. You understand know what I'm saying? No, the Arduino, yeah, yeah, Arduino ROM can run a PD file to their source, but uh, running Python, yeah, it, it can certainly. You can have uh, an Atmel core can run Python code, but um, r- really, I see uh, Raspberry Pi Zero and Raspberry Pi as being the uh, yeah. At least the uh, supervisory control or the networked portions yeah. of the um, each machine I see it in the factory movie building here, and uh, Arduino's or any type of microcontroller is probably going to be Arduino because I can make that easily in the circuit mill. I can have a robot place the parts. I can solder it, and yeah. you know use that for <laughs> tons of other products. That that's going to be a process controller. It's going to drive relays. It's going to drive inputs and also have some feed that to the Pi system that it. The, um, the Raspberry Pis and then feed what we call process data and historian data to the um, plant historian. So, I mean, I'm just really going to treat this whole thing like an industrial, I'm making open source industrial MES and tracking software, but start small. Yeah. And, you know, get the small little features out so we can start getting some profitability. Then I can start to say, and it's all going to start with a website. And I'm going to have you know, maybe that a robot llama or that's open source or some of those. A whole bunch of products that I know work that I can just list and have printers kick off and eject automatically and people, you know, pay for that. Uh, and, is there an open source llama? Um, yeah. Uh, I mean, it may or may not be open source. It's 3D printable. I guess that might be incorrectly assuming 3D printed <laughs> means open source. Uh, if someone has. Design well, because, you know, the perennial problem either. is right. it's like show yeah. me a single product <laughs> that's actually productized, that works, that is open source and and manufacturable in distributed sense. You know, you know what I mean? I mean, that's so extremely that's the thing. rare. It's, it's like products, products, products. I need, I need product. And the thing is, if I can get, I want to get, you know, base open source. La- I mean, I guess there's open source laptop computers that's based on Raspberry Pi, just so screens, there's those. Which any product like that, I need to start, you know, kind of our stream manufacturing here, get down to like, hey, this is what we try to use all the time as our CPU brain. Maybe it's a Raspberry Pi. Maybe a microcontroller, we always use it. We try to keep only a couple PCB board layouts that we're not. We only, our circuit mill doesn't have to worry about cutting all these different yeah. boards. Like, do the absolute most of the absolute minimum and the absolute best, lowest cost. Things. Yeah, yeah. Those are all vitamins that yeah. the factory is not going to be able to produce for a long time. And we want to use economies of scale to buy those MCUs or whatever it is, massive amounts, keep them in a hopper for a robot or a person to grab that we can just throw into these open source products. But first things first is just driving this basic factory, getting basic 3D printed parts out. Yeah. You know, hopefully I can support, uh, you, you know, your business as well, and you, I'd like you to be able to order for me uh, Nick, and uh, Sarah and Alex when they want to do that to order prints uh, for me. I'd like yeah. you to fulfill that. It's a way of getting started, right? <laughs> you know, and then 
use that income and, you know, hopefully eventually maybe become a fellow or whatever ends up working out for me to be able to, um, you know, at some point, um, you know, be able to pursue other products or just have people research right. those open source products. Yeah. Yeah, I'm it, just bringing it's not going to be that big of a deal to print and build that. Right. Yeah, I'm, I'm just saying to differentiate between projects and products because, I mean, uh, yeah, I mean, in terms of uh, something that's manufacturable today, uh, I think that maybe like precious plastic systems are cool. But even like if you take the example of precious plastic, I think, you know, that, that could be a product, but to do some optimization on that and really productization where, where as the iterations go forward, the thing becomes easier to build and less expensive to build and so forth. So, so yeah, so, so right. that the enterprise is robust, not like, you know, takes forever to build or it's not the most efficient and stuff like that. So, so the difference between projects and products, you know, just keeping that very clear. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. I mean, products are just individual products. You're going to have a life cycle constantly evolving and distributed and other people yeah. um, iterating on a product. And that's why we hope we can get it this digital manufacturing and ability as a key part of this uh, system I have. Because for me, off the, off the bat, as soon as I possibly can, one of my higher priority tasks after getting basic, you know, repeatable, ejected prints done is to, you know, of course, have them inspect the quality of the 3D scan, but 3D scanner, the, the next thing is, well, how do I bump apart a poor quality into some in the ground and get up and sell it? Or how do I receive plastic from customers and recycle it? Because it's just, how do we, you know, that, that, that's what products are going to be. They're just this massively recycled, massively remade and uh, tinkered with thing. But projects are more stationary. They move through and they're done. And once, once a project's done, that use of the MES is something that, yeah, it might be iterated upon a little bit, but yeah. it's more of a system. Yeah, yeah. That no, could be robust completely and probably shouldn't be iterated much by individuals. It should say sit the same for the whole distributed enterprise. You can't have everyone trying to make the MES different or the system that glues everything together. It has to be a group effort. Right, sure. Right. Uh, right. Certainly it's, a, it's a platform. It's yeah, a collaborative probably. project. Yep. Yep. For yep. Sure. So what do we want to cover? Yeah. Um, so, um, as, as far as cover, um, yeah, yeah I had like, our discussion, uh, yeah, have conversation to... here. Oh, um, uh, just, I'd like to cover the, um, MES, uh, layout, like the general, general architecture, how it works, uh, things between, uh, parts and assembly instructions and just, uh, generally what a, uh, MES is. Okay. Yeah. Do they have a document or anything outside so, of? Uh, did you want to just yeah. describe it? Yes. Or do you have a document or work up? I do have a document. It's the MES, uh, MES SDS. Okay. Yeah. The, so I see uh, it here. Wait, wait. Got it. Yeah. So go so, ahead. Um, yeah. And so at the top of the document, um, we'll see the uh, general functional description of features of what a MES will have. Um, you know, the phone right now, I have a computer in front of me right now. But, um, the general features are the features for, uh, as stated, you know, probably at the beginning, receiving goods and uh, serializing the goods that are um, received and keeping track of inventory. It's, it's basically a bit bare bones. It's an inventory management system, an inventory tracking, where stuff, where is this stuff at, and how much do we have of products. Yeah. So that's the whole one part is just receiving and inventory management. Inventory tracking. And that is for, part here. for materials, for the parts and yeah. materials that we have yeah, as inputs. Um, materials and, yeah, so it, that's, that's going to be, so for that, it's going to be for materials. Uh, and so everything is pretty much considered a part. Okay. As a material is a part. Okay. Um, as is a uh, completed part that's formed into something. Yeah. Um, you know, that's kind of academic off to the side, but uh, on that uh, academic side of things, they would sort of call raw iron ore a uh, that'd be more of a batch process or an assembly process 
would be more of a control process plant versus an assembly plant. Yeah. This is more of an assembly operation. Yeah. So everything coming in is a part. You're going to have 3D printer filament. You're going to have metal bars. You're, I mean, later we will be perhaps working on that, but that's a whole different type of a system. Yeah. It's dealing with a, a batch and a process management to turn raw materials into uh, finished goods. Yeah. But, um, uh, so, um, yeah, so the next thing after um, assembly out of inventory management is process control and assembly control. That's uh, scheduling all of the build operations based on orders. That's receiving the orders for the plant and deciding how all the parts are going to go to fulfill an order and how are you going to route parts from the factory to produce results. So yeah. someone wants 10 drills, that means um, you're going to have to have however many um, females either tool themselves up to be females if they have changeable heads from printing to start uh, milling up PCB boards, you're going to have to move the PCB board. So that's going to work with the inventory management and tracking system to move those parts around. Um, the system that's keeping track of the... Oh, one moment. Okay, I'm back. So yeah, it needs, it needs to uh, schedule out how are we going to move parts from point to point? How are we going to machine uh, different uh, pieces into so the, circuit, the circuit boards? How are we going to move the uh, filament or start the 3D printers printing parts? And once those parts are printed, how are we going to merge them to a machine or person at a workstation to have them assemble the parts and provide the machine or person with the instructions that assemble those parts together. And so that's just the uh, process control area. And so that's, um, you know, and, and under that you have part inspection after each part being produced, a person or, you know, a 3D scanner um, scan, spinning around the part and inspecting the features, which you can see there um, in that document towards the bottom, I have a whole bunch of bullet points on the giant, uh, breakdown of what a part and assembly instruction is. And you know, in there, a property of a part is a feature. And the feature is going to have dimensions. And each one of those dimensions is something to be inspected. And the part's going to have a picture. So all those pieces go together to inspecting parts for quality, moving them around, reclaiming them, rejecting them, moving them to a final product and tracking the whole system to like origin to sale and serializing those parts so we know, hey, this customer has a defective part. Well, you can go back to what they printed it, what machine printed it, and kind of figure out what's going on with your system. This control... So that's all the prod product flow. Huh? Is this uh, oh, yep. software that would be written in Python? Yeah. Now, yeah, would you... It's, uh, it's just... Go ahead. Would you do that from scratch, or would we be building off an existing application? Yeah, we'd be able to build off uh, existing applications. There actually is, uh, I think, uh, maybe my uh, DPA page or something, I've been linked to some open source MES solutions that are out there that can be used as a uh, design basis for lots of these features and uh, data structures. Mm -hmm. um, but certain of these software modules are, um, it's basically a uh, a database and lots of things to execute are just uh, business intelligence so really it comes down to producing a couple key software modules that are able to execute uh, flow charts that's the most broad way of saying it uh -huh. so each one of these operations of okay like let's take the example I made of a product which consists of parts and the parts of parts and assembly instructions where you can kind of look at it as a chain going down to where you have all the raw materials that are most raw parts that the factory receives. And each of those parts merging together kind of like a, uh, a contest sheet where you have uh, people facing off 
every time two parts meet together, you have an assembly instruction, and that's executed a different machine. You have a module that's just taking that and um, decide, making decisions. So there's a decision-making process. There is a uh, process that can take apart these data structures and make plans. So those are the broad pieces, but the rest of it is just um, basically database management and uh, very pretty complicated SQL tables um, to relate all those products, assembly data, and serial numbers together. But because um, the MES, at the end of the day, it's pretty, it's complicated, but it's kind of dumb at the same time. All those this is, okay, I have this many products to make. Here are the machines I have. Uh, I need to make three three printed parts, okay? And it's just going to say, hey, 3D printer, execute this assembly instruction. So that's what MES is really doing. The 3D printer needs to know, or the Raspberry Pi controlling the 3D printer, needs to know, okay, here's an assembly instruction. Oh, that's the name of this G code file I need to load. It. Or, oh, that's the name of this other G code file for a circuit router or a cutting tool pass. So just a whole bunch of software modules underneath that's going to take care of each part. Do you uh, have a particular open source MES in mind to start with? or? Um, I have one uh, to use sort of for examples on, um, you know, at least it's open source that I'm able to uh, replicate it. But otherwise, um, as far as MES, I have my uh, professional knowledge of. No, but, um, but regarding, out there, but, but, I am Googling open yeah. source MES and things like Hukadu MES appears to be. Yeah. Community edition. There's some stuff. Yeah, dude. From there's certainly a few. I mean, and there's several out there. Yeah. Have you Just, looked at any I of think them? Those yet, are. And real live welcome. I, I have. Um, of and, the, and the thing with those is they are just uh, to me too. I guess complicated is the word. There's a lot. Mm -hmm. and they're very narrow in their adaptability. They don't uh -huh. always. I, they're open source, but they don't. They don't like. Just Python. They have a whole bunch of different complex data structures, they're, and they're narrow. In that, wow, there really isn't a factory quite like what OSE is that really right. exists out there. Uh, they, they, what really the MESs out there are for are, hey, we have this much um, resources, and uh, you know we're going to track what a raw resource goes through as it goes through each machine. But it's not, it's not really tracking so many uh, moving parts at once and so many different products being made at once. Because the factory just makes one product a day. Like they have, hey, you know, when you go to do a return on a product that's broken, it's like, what's the batch number? Because it's just making one thing. They, factories can't do much. They're not adaptable. Yeah. This so you're saying be, that the value uh, addition in this, yeah. in this work would be its modularity, flexibility, simplicity? Yep. Yeah, and that it's uh, there's not much reference work, honestly, unfortunately here that I know of, even professionally from where I work, um, that can be replicated. I mean, there's this, uh, you have some on the Facebook example of that factory, but those are all really super closed source proprietary stuff right. that just came out. This is so, this is too new. I mean, say our MES has some good concepts for database tables that I can use, but we're inventing. Something new. Yeah. Yeah. But, yeah, I mean, I think I can see the value that this is uh, what's going to let someone make their distributive enterprise and what's going to allow people to start producing products. Yep. Um, you know, open source and, you know, otherwise someone can just say, hey, I want, I want to see a CNC job or I have a 3D printing job. Um, people... And they can use do milling for the local automotive plant, plant maybe. Yeah. You know, it's just going to start kicking off a whole bunch of different, um, just going to enable a lot of people to do a lot of things. Yeah. That's great. That's about all I have to say. Um, you know, that, that's, that's a broad level of this, of what it's doing. Uh, taking stuff in and basically telling machines or people how to build something and keeping track of it every step of the way. 
uh, to the point that either um, someone could have robots to handle it or people could handle it and make san- sanity. And the whole idea for me personally is I like to have robots every, you know, separate ways. So um, and kind of realizing our whole lifestyle, I think it'd be great to have people in our communities, you know, either live in an apartment community or you live or you're a landowner or whichever situation you're in to be able to hey we need this stuff have it made and instead of someone working in a sweatshop in a factory going in and collecting the goods i mean i see robotics and automation as an empowering powerful humanistic force that we can kind of use or put our brains into matter and make it do something uh versus something that needs to be Taking our jobs, their livelihoods, no, I, I think can provide for us in this kind of way. I don't exactly. think it's a stifling thing at all. I think there's room, but I think there's also room for people. If they want to do labor, they can labor. But uh, I see having this thing provide, you know, others. We have other systems in our ecology for power and food, and maybe even communications at one point that I can produce goods for other people in my community, and I can get out there and do with my children or help out the community and help the poor build some houses, do some good instead yeah. of working a job where I'm just sitting at a desk. So that's what I see here. Yeah. Not exactly right. Cool. And let me know if I, um, so, yeah, I guess the last thing to cover is just, uh, get anyone else in the uh, team start to organize this a bit more. Um, this in the next steps is kind of to break this down more that uh, I can hand off those modules to software developers if they're there. And if yeah. they're not there, I can work on one piece at a time. Yeah. Uh, as far as getting a, an instance of a, you know, a basic operation, I mean, what, what kind of time frame do you think you, you could do that with your available time? Uh, oh, two, two months. Yeah. I hope, uh, two months, uh, mm-hmm. two to three months to have, uh, um, cause this is just, you know, uh, something basically just knocking the print off of our uh, our good release uh, print bed. Yeah. Um, Octo print, and I'm gonna start with just one printer. I mean, this just starts with one printer, um, a whole bunch of G code files on hand, and a web store. And y'all you know, grab whatever web store I have, just to just to eliminate variables that might get like Wix or whatever web store there is just to start so I can get order then <laughs> start to eject the parts and get something out, you know. Um, but yeah, uh, the basic functionality is <laughs> take a queue of jobs, um, have G code files that are referenced and name those jobs and load those on a printer and have some basic end script for doing a quick countdown, you know, until the print bed's cool and just pushing the part off. That's not going to be horrible. Oh, uh, can you, are you saying that you would have a, a system that's automated from the order or would you take the order and manually start a job? <clears throat> oh, no, nah. it would uh, be automated. Nope. Yeah. Um, you, it would take um, the order and then the printer would start. Um, yeah, that's, that's very interesting. So, so for example, using something like Octoprint, right? So you can... Uh, oh, yeah, certainly. Have a web server Octoprint that would receive and have some basic code to kick off a, a job on a Octoprint. Yep. Yeah. yeah no, that would be, I mean, if we can execute a very simple module <coughs> like that, where, okay, you've got a web front on it, you put in your credit card, and you say, buy. And initially, what I would suggest is, is doing simply proven parts. Don't don't start with letting people upload their own files oh, yet. You got me 100%. Yeah. yeah Everything yeah. at the start of this is going to be my pre-selected part. Yes. I know work and that's it. <laughs> exactly. So we have them uh, give you some money through a credit card or however. Uh, the system just logs that and it kicks off a job automatically at your home. Yeah. Microfactory, which would be our microfactory version 0.01 or 0.1. Exactly. Getting good. Yeah, and it's going to pop that out and just, but you know, early on, I'm going to work on those data structures because early on, that order received is going to be called a product. And as we talked about, a product's a part and a, and a part has assembly instructions, and the most simple one for us is just a 3D print. Doesn't, it's not much far down the road. 
to have, you know, just a simple database in G code. I'm oh, making yeah. a product that has two parts of circuit board and that. And having one be milling out a circuit board using our our man's awesome <laughs> that, that thing's looking really good to get a circuit mill. You know, mm-hmm. cutting up, you know, cutting up some circuit boards for us. So yeah, let's just start small and grow from there. Yeah, yeah. No, that's great. That's awesome. So I look forward to it. Yeah, yeah, let's hope we can get some results. I know I uh, try to get myself to get uh, two hours a day and see if that works out. But yeah, yeah, yeah I have it's a, not a, a mission now. So Yeah, it's not a daunting, super daunting problem, but it, it does have a lot of due diligence. But this, in, in the open source, that pretty much puts the average person, wow, to a pretty high level. Because, I mean, I, I think the desktop industrial revolution is still to come in terms of many more people being able to produce things. Absolutely. That has to happen because because it can be very very efficient too. Yeah. Uh, yeah. All, all we need all we need is this 3D printing and just you know it's so fast to say hey here's an assembly instruction that yeah. and here's the part we need this part needs to go to a machine called a circuit yeah. mill. And if we can find someone who's good in robots, they can drop off a, a a piece of material there, and it can cut that. I can I can get a robot to work to do that. Yeah. And you know if you have a, if you have a circuit board, mill. If you have parts. I mean, even if you can't pick and place the solder yet, oh man, if you just have a kit that you can ship to people, that's huge too. Yeah. You know? Yeah. If you can just no, absolutely. Put, ship off I mean, a 3D printed kit, electronics kit. Yeah. I mean, think about this. I mean, all the right parts. If you do have this system up, up and going and you've got a number of proven parts, I mean, the number of parts that you can be doing for an on demand custom store is just tremendous. Like, Think about all the plumbing fittings, all kinds of things that are plastic there. I mean, there's just so many things. But I think the challenge is to get that quality control up so that we are guaranteed like very specific profiles for printing and quality that when you order a PVC fitting or whatever kind of fitting, it's actually yeah. working really well and it's like the one at the store without you saying, hey, what is this? This doesn't work. No, it, it has to work yeah work well yeah. and that's and so that's, that's the challenge so beautiful and what's beautiful is remember my concepts there and read through that uh, in detail and remember that every part has uh features and features have met- uh, metrology information exactly meteorological information and that goes in the 3d scanner which is an assembly instruction it's not really assembly instruction but it's a machine acting on a part and it has a result yeah, and the result will be hey, that thing that goes to the grinder or it moves on. <laughs> yeah, so that will be. Yeah, yeah, and this right. The the beauty of this is how, you know, how, yeah, you can automate all those processes, including the full life cycle management, where hopefully soon oh, yeah. enough we can get the part where okay, you're done with the product, ship it back to us. We're gonna grind it up again and make new new products out of it or, or recycle the parts. Yeah. So it's on my wiki, uh, on the wiki page, check out the uh, inventory management module it talks about. It's called a total life cycle management. It's an industrial like term and all the rest to do that. Um, tracking a, a skew from the way it was manufactured, every machine that touched it to what uh, customer has it. Okay, I'm not seeing that on the MES SDS page. Is that there? Oh, it's not there. Life, oh wait, yeah, um, I mean it's yeah, total thought, asset thought, life cycle inventory management. Okay, yeah, yeah, yeah. Yep, yeah. So, and that goes down to like, hey, this was made here at this uh, lab you launched to this offset here, went to this customer, this address. Yeah, yeah. And every single machine touched it. It's it, it's all going to be there, but uh, just it's a, you know you know me as you work with me for the past year, I have grand ideas, but. You, you got to start with one small thing. Yeah, yeah. And grow it. Yeah, absolutely, absolutely. But yeah, you, but you have to start off making sure it's all going to be there and end, which is difficult to go between. <laughs> yeah, crazy grandiose to small and you know yeah. manageable. Yes, what you're referring to is the grand old challenge of of the difference between vision and execution, which are two uh, yeah. different things. And I got a lot of vision, but working on the execution side, so. At least yeah. you know what I, hey, whatever, whatever I end up doing, you know, you know what this is now. <laughs> yeah. Excellent. Yeah. Excellent. Thanks for sharing. So yeah, we'll see you then next developer meeting. Anything else? 
yeah, that, that's all. I'll see you guys next developer meeting, and uh, hopefully, I hope to have uh, some basic G code done, and maybe the C3 Ohio at least running in some regard. So on that shitty extruder, crappy extruder, <laughs> hopefully I can get that to run. But yeah. uh, we have it. Uh, you know, hopefully, I have some prints, and I have some basic uh, code for ejecting a part. Excellent. Excellent. We'll see. All right. All right, John. Well, thanks a lot. So, yeah, Godspeed. Thank you. We'll talk soon. Welcome. Bye. Bye bye.